Hi, welcome to Actual LOL, I'm John Perkis. I recently went to the UK Games Expo where I picked up a whole bunch of new board games and played a load of new board games and upcoming board games. And I just want to tell you about the ones I've played so you can decide whether they're right for you. So starting with On the Underground, this is a prototype of a game that's coming to Kickstarter soon from Luda Creations. And it's a reprint of a game from 2006 and it's about building the un London Underground, the tube network. So you've got a map of London that roughly depicts the tube and you will be placing down train lines onto this map, a little bit like Ticket to Ride, to connect up different locations. And the primary reason for that is because there's a passenger that is going to be traveling to different destinations. You can see four location cards that are different stops on this map and the passenger will be traveling to them and you will be trying to create lines so that you can make it easier for that passenger to get there. And you're competing with the other players because you want the passenger to take your routes and not theirs. And so you will be just taking actions to place down lines on this board. It's really interesting. It's like a light medium strategy game that feels very different to Ticket to Ride, even though you are playing train lines. There's a few other ways to get points connecting to national rail stations and to terminuses. It's gonna be slightly different every time you play because of the way those passenger cards come out and the locations they're gonna be going to, because you will get a point every time the passenger uses your line. So you really want to be getting that passenger to use you at the end of everyone's turn because it moves at the end of everyone's turn. And really that's where the crux of the points are. So it, it really depends where he is and then where he's going to as to uh, how you best want to create your lines. And it's really interesting how often people's lines can really end up looking a lot like the real tube lines. And of course, I love the theme of this because I happen to live in London, uh, but it's it's a really approachable strategy game that feels very different to anything I've played because there's a real tactical element to trying to constantly look at what's coming up and plan towards it. Um, the, the great thing about this version is that there's also a Berlin map on the other side. So that wasn't in the original game from 13 years ago. Uh, so there's a whole other map that represents Berlin and um, that plays slightly differently. It has a few extra mechanisms. So that's going to be on Kickstarter in a few weeks. And if you want to check it out, it's called On the Underground. Letter Jam from Czech Games Edition is a cooperative word building game where you can't see your own letters. So you will all have a letter in front of you that is facing outwards so that everyone can see your letter except you and you can see everyone else's letter. And you are trying to work out what that letter is. And you're doing that by creating words and your teammates are creating words that use as many letters as possible. So you're all just kind of looking at the letters that are available to you. It's very much like Hanabi in the sense that you can see other people's cards but not your own. And you're trying to create a word with them. And you're trying to use as many as possible. If you create a word, you sort of say, oh, I've got a six letter word. You don't say the word. You put tokens down in front of the letters that you used and in the order that you use them. So if somebody else, knows that their letter is space one in this word and they know all the other letters and the order they come in, then let's say the word sort of ends up with like ibbed. So they think that the word is ribbed maybe or fibbed. So they, for, they know then that their letter is probably R or F as long as they've worked out all the possible words it could be. And so they are making notes on a little sheet, very much like a deduction game, trying to remember what they learned from the previous round and like capture what that letter is. If they think they know it, they lock it in and then they're onto their next letter in their set of cards because you're really just trying to get through your letters as quickly as possible so that you can all win the game before the sort of time runs out. And at the end of the game, you will have be trying to create a five letter word from the letters that you've been playing with. And so the that word, has been set up by another player before the start of the game. So it's a real word, but you don't know if all the letters that you think you locked in are actually the letters that you guessed. So at the end, you're trying to work out what that word is, but then sometimes you might not actually be able to find a word because you must've got one of those letters wrong along the way. It's 
a really interesting puzzle and just I really like the deductive element of it. A lot of people were loving this game and to be honest it was my favourite game that I played at the convention. I really wanted to be able to take it home but it's still just a prototype and it's going to be coming out later this year. And because it's from the company uh, behind Codenames, a lot of people were comparing it to Codenames. I mean, Codenames for me is like a modern classic party game that almost cannot be beaten. Letter Jam, very different, um, but I, I can see why people are making those connections because of the company link. I think that Letter Jam is more thinky because it's a deduction game. There's a bit more going on internally. Um, sort of making your notes on the paper and really trying to think things through. It's a very clever game and it's a really engaging game, but it doesn't have the same sort of party game feel or the discussion of Codenames because you're doing a lot of the stuff on your own. Even though you are playing cooperatively, there isn't much to talk about because you very much have to keep secret what you know about the other player's letters. But a fascinating game. I can't wait to get my copy of Letter Jam later this year. Seize the Bean is a deck building card game about running a coffee shop in Berlin. This one I got to play a full game of on the Friday and I was really impressed by how the theme comes through in this game. So you are got your own little coffee shop and you have resources such as sugar and milk and coffee beans and you are having to serve the customers. You start off with a very small deck which represents your friends and family because you've just opened up this coffee shop and then as you build up hype you will be attracting new customers into your customer deck and then at the end of the round you'll be flipping over these cards and you have to serve them the things that they want. So you'll also be expanding your coffee shop, you'll be adding in new lines of coffee, adding in new equipment, things that are going to really improve your engine and make you better at getting in resources and serving customers. But you've just got to make sure that the customers you attract you're able to keep them because if you're not able to uh, serve them then they're going to leave you a bad review and the points in this game are good reviews and so you are desperately trying to impress all your customers that come along. It comes with really nice components, these uh, coffee bean looking things and these sugar cubes and little cartons of milk and you can also get extra deluxe tokens that just honestly it's one of the nicest looking games that I've ever played with uh, if you get all those extra bits as well. But the theme of it really comes through in the way that you play. You have different strategies for the type of customers. So I was going down a hipster strategy. So they were creating a lot of hype because they're talking about it online. So that's getting more customers in. But they want very specific types of fancy coffee. So you've got to make sure that you're serving them. You've got tourists that actually lose you hype because, of course, they're giving your coffee shop a negative reputation by just being overrun by tourists. And it's just fascinating how in such a simple way those different types of customers play very differently and give you different strategies to go down. I understand that the finished game will come with different decks that represent different districts of Berlin and they all give you a different game feel in terms of strategy. This one definitely had a lot to think about. I love the way the theme came through. It's very tricky to get a full feel of a game that's sort of this weight at a convention because you're exhausted. You're trying to learn on the fly. I found the iconography was a little bit tricky to get my head around, but I think that once you play the game a few times, you'll have it. And of course, you'll have reference sheets with the finished version of the game. So I just can't wait to play this one again properly when it comes out uh, and really give it a proper review. And that is Seize the Bean. Undo Cherry Blossom Festival is one of three games in the new Undo series from Pegasus Spieler. And these are interesting storytelling games where you have to go back in time to stop somebody's death. So in this instance, a Japanese man in his 60s has died and you will be going back to different events in his life and events close to people involved in his life and trying to learn about what has happened to him, why his life ended up this way and how you can change his death. And you're trying to then make decisions that will change his fate and save his life really fascinating premise that I was really excited by. I've played this one, I haven't played the other two yet. The way it plays is very simple. There are 13 cards that represent different events in his life. You have to decide where you want to visit and then you will flip over a card, read it, learn something about an event in his past and then you have to make a decision that affects that event. How can you change fate slightly so that you can save him in the future? And you're really just doing that based on your intuition. That's what I found fascinating about this game is that you're making choices based on really just 
real life stuff. You are having to use your emotional intelligence and think, what is going on here? You can't quite see the full picture ever, but you are getting little signs from the things that you're reading about what might be going on in his life. And you are trying to learn from that and then make decisions that, so you're sort of trying to guess how he died exactly and then how might be the best way to save him in the ways that you can have an effect. It's different to almost any game I've played. The only one I would relate it to is something like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, where again, you're looking at sort of real life situations and you're trying to look at human characters and stories and use your own experience as a person. There's no sort of points or maths or strategy or anything like that. It isn't a puzzle like an escape room game. It is very much a story that you are trying to relate to and use your empathy to make decisions like that. And I could totally understand that some people wouldn't like that. It feels sort of light as a game and it, it, it doesn't feel like anything else and it doesn't necessarily have that same feedback that you might get from a traditional game. You are getting points, but I think some people might be frustrated with this. They might feel like there wasn't enough information. Whereas for me, I feel like there was just enough. And it reminds me of moments in time stories where you use your intuition and you, you, you really felt that you're going down the right path and then the game rewards you. And those little hints that you got actually really meant something. I love the theme of this. Um, uh, I, I found it interesting. It, it felt like I was learning about a person's life and I'm really looking forward to playing the other games like this. Just beware the type of game that it is and, uh, it, you know, maybe try it once and then you'll know whether it's the type of game for you. But I'm really excited to try the other games in this series. That is Undo. Copenhagen is a family weight Tetris style game from Queen Games. And the idea of this is that you're building houses in the neighborhood of Nyhaven in Copenhagen, and you are placing down Tetris tiles, these colorful tiles, to build the facade of a house. And the way you are collecting those tiles is by picking up colored cards, a little bit like Ticket to Ride, so you either pick up cards or play cards, and you're trying to collect sets of colors to then trade them in. So if I was to trade in three yellow cards, I would get a Tetris piece that is made up of three squares, and then I'm placing it onto my board. It's a very simple in terms of rules, this game. But what's nice about it is it just has a few little twists that make it an thinky enough and have that extra level of decision making that you sort of expect from a Queen Games game. Um, so if you are placing down a Tetris piece next to another one of the same color, you don't have to play as many cards. You can pay one less card to buy that piece. You also have these action tiles that allow you to do extra things, like they can take your hand size up, they can allow you to pick up and play cards on the same turn, and you'll be, when you use them, you'll spend it, flip it over. The way you reactivate those is by playing a Tetris piece onto a certain part of your board that has a little symbol on. So when you cover up those symbols, you will then be able to get more special abilities, and that is just gonna improve your efficiency at the game. So you really wanna focus for those, but it's quite hard to focus for those because then that creates problems with how you lay out your shapes. Of course, all the shapes are very different, so you wanna be collecting certain types of colors to get the shapes you really want. And then the really thinky bit is trying to get those rows and columns because that's how you get points. You're racing to get 12 points. You get a point if you finish off a row, you get two points if you finish off a column, but if you're able to get them all filled up with windows, those points double and it's so tricky to do because each Tetris shape has a certain number of windows on. So you're really trying to place them in a certain way that you can get those windows in the right rows and columns in a perfect set. And it, it's just, honestly, it's just really tricky. It's so simple on rules. It plays really quickly. It's got that real nice speed of play of something like Ticket to Ride. So if you're looking for a game like Ticket to Ride, you like those Tetris games, this is definitely that way. It, it's thinky enough to give gamers um, a lot to go on and, and definitely kind of the best player wins with this. It's probably not um, as heavy as some people would like, but I think it's a really great gateway style game 
um, and I've really enjoyed Copenhagen. I also picked up some expansions for Copenhagen. These are called Queenies. Uh, Queen Games do a lot of these expansions that really take their base level games and take them up a notch. So this one introduces new ability tiles. It introduces mission tiles. So you're trying to create certain patterns on your board. Uh, also joker tiles that can be any color. Um, and then uh, there's also multicolored tiles in this one. And then I also got an expansion for Luxor. This has uh, special missions as well, things that you're trying to complete. And that was one of my favorite games of last year. Overbooked is one I haven't played yet. This is from Jumbo. And I was really attracted to the theme and the artwork of this one. It seems to be quite a simple abstract game about trying to place passengers onto an airline flight. So the theme being that obviously you have overbooked and you're trying to make everyone happy, get all the different types of passengers into the seats on your plane. So you've each got a player board that represents the different seats of your aeroplane. Um, so it seems to be very simple on the rules and it's just got a really nice look to it. And I like that it's a real world theme, but a little bit different to your average thing. I've never seen a game that tackles this kind of subject matter. And I think there's just something quite cute about it. So I'm looking forward to trying this one out and hope it meets my expectations. That is overbooked. Mega City Oceana is a really interesting, different game from Hub Games. It's a dexterity game, but crossed with some light strategy. The idea is that you are all building a new floating city. You've got these hexagonal tiles and you are building up structures on them with these plastic pieces that you were drawing out of a bag. You've got different types of pieces. You've got glass and steel and concrete, and you are having to meet certain goals on these cards. So you've got certain different colored tiles that represent different types of buildings. Like I say, you've got the different materials and your, your cards, your goals will be telling you certain things. They need to be of a certain height. They need to maybe only contain certain types of materials. And then you're building the structure and then when you've completed it, you'll be moving it into the center to add to this floating city. It's a really interesting dexterity game. You are all playing at the same time in the sense that you'll take your turns to take actions, which might involve taking new pieces or taking a new goal card. But then on everyone else's turn, you are putting together your structures. So there's really no downtime. There are things to think about in terms of the goals that you're aiming for, but also that it's forcing you to do certain things. Like you can get extra points if you build the biggest structure in the town. And then if other people beat you, then of course they're gonna then get that award. There's these parks that you create monuments in and you want to build buildings next to those parks. So it has a few aspects that you would find in a city building game, but then it also has that fun thing of stacking up a dexterity game. I tend to like lighter dexterity games. This one is such a quirky one that I think it's going to be for people that like a bit of dexterity, but they also want a bit more going on. I don't think the rules are too complicated. Uh, it's probably sort of 45 minutes to an hour and it offers something like no other game. So that is Mega City Oceana. Shobu is an abstract strategy game from Smirk and Laughter Games. This one's got a really nice look to it. It's got four wooden boards uh, that have white and black stones on, and then there's a rope down the middle. But what you're doing is you are making a move on one board, and then that is affecting the move that you do on another board. Uh, it's really interesting. So uh, I would always start on my side. So I pick either the top or bottom to start on. And so I could make a move, move a stone one space, for example. I cannot attack on my boards, I can just move. Then I do exactly the same move on the other board, which can attack, i.e. can move one of my opponent's pieces and I'm trying to get them off the side of the board. But I would always do it on this sort of diagonally opposite board from the one I started from. So there's a lot to think about because you've really got to plan out each board. And sometimes you'll be in a position where you're right on the verge of sort of finishing them off because you win by just knocking off all of their pieces off of one board. So if you're able to knock them all off of that one board, great. But you could be in a position to do it, but then on that opposite board that you need to move from to, to kind of have that uh, chain reaction, you can't move because of where the stones are, where you are on that board. So you've really got to plan with all of the boards in mind. 
Really fascinating game. Very simple on the rules, just like every great abstract strategy game. I think this could be a really interesting kind of two-player couples game, the kind I like, like games like Hive and Onitama. So can't wait to get this one when it comes out. That is Shobu. Welcome to Dino World. This is a roll and write game, definitely on the heavier side of roll and write games. I haven't had a chance to try this one yet, but it had a lot of buzz at the convention. The booth was just busy all the time with people demoing this, and I think they sold a lot of copies of it. So I'm really excited to check it out because people seem to really like it. Just a bit worried it might be a bit heavy for me. It's coming from designer David Turtsy, who designed Anachrony, and uh, he tends to like kind of more complicated games, but I do like his game Kitchen Rush. Uh, so I'm hoping for some good thematic reasoning behind the mechanisms in this one. And I do really like roll and write games, so I'm looking forward to checking this one out. That is Welcome to Dino World. Paranormal Detective. This is a party game from Lucky Duck Games, who made Chronicles of Crime, which was one of my favorite games of last year. This one's going to be coming to Kickstarter soon. It's a really interesting premise. One player is playing as a ghost. They have recently died and you have to work out how they died. So they are communicating to the rest of the group in various different interesting ways, how they died. So the, the, the who, the what, the where, the why, and you then have to work that out, just like a sort of deduction game, a bit like Cluedo and those types of things. Uh, but you're working competitively. It, it is a bit reminiscent of Mysterium in terms of that theme, but it's not a cooperative game. You are trying to solve the mystery on your own. Uh, but you're all getting sort of information at the same time, largely. The ghost is communicating in the different ways that these action cards allow. So uh, there's a Ouija board which allows the ghost to move to different letters. They can move to five different letters, except the letters are combined up into sets of three. So you'll sort of have to deduce by writing down what word they were going for. Um, they also have the ability to arrange bits of string in a pattern. So it's sort of like doing a drawing, but we had this happen in our game and we had no idea what they were trying to get across. So that one's a bit tricky for both the ghost and the guesses to work out what's going on. Uh, they can also draw something on your back. So that's the only bit of information you get that is specific to you. Another uh, thing that um, the ghost can do is pick certain tarot cards that will give a bit of information. Of course, they are a bit vague in the types of information they can give. And then when you think you've got the answer, you're gonna make a guess. You're gonna say it out loud, the, the basically the who, the what, the why, the when, the how, and then the ghost is gonna say whether you got it right, in which case you'd win the game. If you don't get it right, you will then be told how many things you got right or wrong. Um, the other players don't know, uh, but they've obviously heard your guesses, so they're maybe being a bit influenced by that. Um, we found it quite tricky to actually get to the right answers, but eventually somebody did. Um, and it's nice, if you get it wrong first time, you, you stay in the game, you get another opportunity, and so you can kind of learn from your mistakes. I thought I was really close, I guessed, and I got one thing right out of the five. It's very different to any other party game I've played. I like that it's a murder deduction game. They have this little story as to what happened on the card, so the ghost can always give a little bit more information. And I, I found that it helped in terms of the deduction because it sort of made sense, our scenario, as a story that you could kind of maybe piece in the gaps a little bit um, and, and fill it in so that you could get to the answer quicker. I really like that about it. My only sort of maybe problem with the game is not really a, a fault of the design, but just that it's maybe a little bit solitary because it's one of those classic deduction games it doesn't have the wonderful discussion of something like Mysterium and the silliness of some of the things like drawing on the back lend itself to a more of a kind of a group thing. But because you're trying to keep secrets and all trying to win at the same time, uh, I don't know how that one's going to play out. I really want to play this one more. I, I definitely excited to give it another chance. And I think uh, it's got lovely artwork. I think it's very different to any other party game. So uh, I'd recommend checking it out. That is Paranormal Detective. Pandemic Rapid Response is a new game in the Pandemic line, but this one's quite different to other Pandemic games. It's not designed by Matt Leacock, and it's a real-time dice game where instead of having a map of the world, you've actually got a plane. It, it, you, the board represents a plane, and you are trying to move around uh, to deliver um, water, vaccines, and food uh, sort of 
to humanitarian disasters. So it's got a similar theme and I really like that theme. One of the reasons I love Pandemic, but the gameplay is very different. I haven't had a chance to play this one yet, but the idea is that you're rolling dice in real time, but you're taking it in turns. It's from designer Kane Klenko who made Fuse and Flatline, which are both great real time dice games. Um, so he's kind of bringing a similar feel to the Pandemic theme. Uh, I'm a little bit wary because I love Pandemic generally because of Matt Leacock's awesome designs and the theme's a little bit different on this one but I do like real-time dice games so generally looking forward to checking it out and see whether it can meet my expectations. That's Pandemic Rapid Response. La Vigna is a card game about picking grapes and making wine. The theme of this is that you're an heir of a vineyard, somebody's just died, and you are trying to prove yourself as the rightful heir, the person that's gonna do the best job. The mechanisms are quite simple. You are walking through a vineyard. So it has a mechanism similar to Takedo where you are going in one direction, you can't ever go back, and you are picking grapes from the different lines. So you could go jump forward to get grapes you really want, but then you won't be able to go back to previous ones. And so you, there's kind of a balance between getting the grapes that you really want versus just getting lots of grapes. And if you finish first, you'll be able to sell your wine first. So there's different um, sellers cards for each game is going to be slightly different. They're going to want different types of grapes. So you've got Garnacha and Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. So you're set collecting the different types of grapes you're going to need and then trying to deliver them and making sure that you have enough of them. So you play through a number of rounds until one player has delivered a certain number of their wines and you count up points. So it's it's quite simple in terms of set collection. There's a few little thinky decisions in terms of that um, card selection, in terms of the order. There's a few little tools that allow you maybe to pick, pick up two cards at a time. Um, and you've got those goal cards. Can you race ahead against someone? I, I was collecting this, I had this awesome hand of Cabernet Sauvignon and someone had just rushed ahead and there was only one spot left and they fulfilled the order before I did. And I just had all these cards that I couldn't get nearly as many points from at the end of that round. So lots of decisions to this one. I've only played it once, got really nice artwork, comes in a lovely small box as well. So sort of surprising amount of depth for what you're getting in such a small box. So I, I really like the theme of it as well. I just need to give it a couple more plays. That is La Vigna. Blockbuster is a party game from Big Potato that is inspired by, of course, the rental video chain Blockbuster. And it comes in an old school VHS cassette case, which is just a wonderful uh, way to display a game. It's a game about movies. You're playing head to head at the start with a timer. So you press uh, this button here and then you will have to be shouting out um, for example, you've got a category such as movies with dogs. So I'll say 101 Dalmatians. And then the next person will say Beethoven. And you keep going until somebody can't get a movie with dogs. Then the timer will run out. That player then gets the opportunity to select a bunch of cards that will then go into the next round. So they get to pick the slightly easier films that they're going to be playing with. That's what it sounds like when it ends. Um, and so they are going to be uh, trying to get their team to guess certain films and they're doing it in three different ways. So it reminds me a little bit of the hat game or monikers or those types of things because there's three different ways of getting across. So the first one is to just say one word. Uh, the second one is to quote the film. Uh, but if you can't think of a quote, you can just sort of make something up. Um, and the third one would be to act out like to do charades. So I haven't had a chance to play this one yet, I haven't had my sort of party game group together, but really looking forward to it. I think it could be a really nice sort of mass market thing, uh, the sort of thing you might give to someone at Christmas. I just hope it holds up for a more board gamery party game uh, audience. That is Blockbuster. Detective LA Crimes is an expansion for Detective, a modern crime board game, which was my favorite board game of last year, 2018. It's a game about trying to solve Crimes, it's quite a rich, in-depth, narrative-driven game where you are given a case, you are given all this different evidence, you have interrogation reports, you are finding out about the different witnesses and suspects and you are trying to solve that case and it plays over different scenarios and there's a story that kind of runs through them. LA Crimes is simply a 
completely separate expansion with a whole new set of cases. It's got three cases. It's set in the 80s in Los Angeles, whereas Detective was set in modern times in a, in a different part of America. And of course, I'm just absolutely uh, excited to try it out because it was my favorite game of last year. I hope that the cases in this are just as, as rich and interesting and using the technology and that amazing twist that the original game had, which is it gets you to search things on the internet, to research real life information that will be relevant to the cases that you're playing. It's an amazing thing that works really well in the original game and I just can't wait to try these. Iron Forest is a game that I got a sneak peek at. This is coming from Brain Games who make the game Ice Cool, which is a dexterity game where you're flicking penguins um, through this big sort of board made out of boxes um, and through school corridors. It's a really fun dexterity game for kids and for families. And Iron Forest is taking that idea and making a game for adults and it's adding some really cool stuff. So I just got to see an early version of this and one of the best things about it is that it is two stories. So you've got these plastic poles that mean that you're effectively got a game that looks a lot like Ice Cool, but then on two different stories and you're flicking these shapes through uh, the rooms, but then there are holes in the top floor. So then the pieces can fall down. So you might be trying to avoid those holes or you might be trying to use those holes. And then there's this incredible device which you can put your piece in and then hammer down and it flies your piece up onto that second story and hopefully into a spot that you want. So there's going to be a whole bunch of different um, gameplay scenarios with this and I didn't get to play a full game but I think there's great potential for Iron Forest. It's got a really nice look to it and they're very much trying to make Ice Cool which really is a game that adults can enjoy but really take it up a notch and make it a proper adult game with a few extra rules, still keep it simple, still keep it the fun of a flicking game, but just adding those extra cool things like playing on two stories. So I can't wait to try the finished version of Iron Forest. I think it's gonna be on Kickstarter later this year. Caper is a two player card game where you are hiring criminals, you're trying to complete heists and you're trying to be better than the other player. I haven't had a chance to play this one yet. I've heard wonderful things about it really hoping it's gonna be a new kind of two player couples game that I can get into. The artwork is wonderful. It's got a bit of drafting, a bit of set collection, and uh, I, I really like this type of theme with a slightly uh, sort of silly uh, take on crime. Uh, reminds me a little bit of Burgle Brothers, which is a game that I love. So can't wait to try out Caper. Terror Below is coming from Renegade Games. And this one has a really nice theme to it. Reminds me of the film Tremors. It's a map where these big giant worms are coming out of the ground and you are driving around. You are trying to research them in a kind of pick up and deliver way to get points, or you're trying to just build up your arsenal so that you can kill them off and get points that way. There's gonna be some interaction in terms of slightly screwing over other players because you can take the worms in their direction where maybe they're gonna be weak and not be able to um, sort of fight well against them and there's going to be different special cards and I feel like it's going to have a real theme to it so I didn't get a chance to play this one but I, I did have it explained to me and I, I just really like the look and the sound of it. I'm hoping it's going to be a new game from Renegade that's a little bit like Clank, a game with a nice theme that really comes out in the gameplay and feels different to almost any other game out there. That is Terror Below. Board Game Book is a book about board games this is edited by Owen Duffy, who writes a lot of articles for The Guardian about board games. He's collaborated with some other journalists, Matt Thrower, Terry Latorco, and they have written a book which recommends a whole bunch of different board games, talks about them in various ways. Uh, so for example, you'll have like a spread here about Azul, has like an overview, explains a bit about the game, and then each one has an interview with the designer of the game, so you can learn a bit about, a bit behind the game. Um, I haven't had a chance to properly delve into this one yet, but this is coming from proper journalists. Uh, it was on Kickstarter, and um, I, I think it's going to be a really interesting read. That is Board Game Book. Lantern's Dice is a roll and write game from Renegade. The idea with this one is that you are filling in a sheet. So uh, whoever first turn is will roll the dice. They represent different colors, and then you'll be using these colors to cross off the different um, triangles on your sheet to try and complete squares and then create different patterns because you are trying to get Tetris shapes on your 
uh, on your sheet to win points and you're racing to get those shapes for four other players to get higher amounts of points. What's interesting about it is that it's got a few extra twists that make it more thinky. Uh, if you cross off a section here, you get one of these gifts that can then be used to trade in for a special ability, which is going to speed up, allow you to cross out more things. Uh, when you roll your dice, you're going to rotate the dice tray they come in and decide who gets what color. So you pick your color for yourself, but you're also determining the other four players' colors. Um, and so maybe you could have a look at their sheet and see which color you don't want to give them. Um, you can re-roll colors by using these gifts. Uh, you have these platforms here. If you complete that, you get a free uh, space that you can cross off next to it. So another chaining thing. Uh, and then at the end of the game, you're scoring points for those Tetris shapes that you've won. They actually come as tiles that you uh, put onto your sheet. Uh, you're also going to score for your second biggest region. And there's these boats that you're trying to score adjacent to. So uh, it's got a lot of thinkiness in terms of which uh, dice you pick at the time, how you use those special abilities. It's not one of my favorite roll and write games. I tend to lean towards ones that are a little bit more punishing and frustrating like Railroad Inc or Avenue. And this one's a little bit softer, but probably with a bit more decision making in terms of trying to get points in the right way. So I, I think there's definitely an audience for uh, out there for this one. It's just not to my taste. That is Lantern's Dice. Ticket to Ride London is a shorter, simpler version of Ticket to Ride set in London. It has a map of London and you are collecting and playing sets of colored cards to try and complete different routes on the board to place down your plastic buses so that you can complete certain tickets. You've got these cards that require you to connect up different destinations on this map of London. This one is much shorter than your classic game of Ticket to Ride, maybe plays in about 20 to 30 minutes, but has all the kind of similar rules. It's got really nice artwork. The different cards represent, you've got like a double decker bus and a London taxi and a milk float. I like this one as a, a simple introduction. If you don't have time to play Ticket to Ride, then it, it's kind of, I played it with people that weren't really gamers and it's, it's like Ticket to Ride, but shorter. I feel like it doesn't have as interesting an arc um, as your classic Ticket to Ride US or Europe. I feel like those games reward you. That I think they're actually almost better, better as a gateway game because they give you a better feel of what it's like to have a strategy and to then pivot with your tactical decisions. Whereas this one is just over so quickly. To be honest, I'm mostly gonna be keeping it because it's Ticket to Ride London. But if, if you find Ticket to Ride too long, uh, then this one is a good alternative. Time Chase is another game that I got showed at the Renegade booth. This is a trick-taking game with a time travel theme. I don't tend to like trick-taking games that much, but the interesting twist on this definitely has me excited. You are time traveling back through tricks. So for example, you, you've all played your different cards for a trick and they are set out at a certain era and then you'll go on and play another one. But then you can go back to a previous trick that someone else already won and change what happened in that trick, change the card that you played. So maybe now you're winning it. So there's this interesting sort of area control thing where you're looking at maybe like five or 10 tricks and you are trying to win as many as possible by using this time travel mechanism. Silver is an upcoming card game from Bezier Games. This is set in their werewolf universe, but it's not a hidden traitor game. It's actually more like a traditional card game uh, with numbered cards and you are trying to get the lowest score, I believe, so you attract the least amount of werewolves, but it all really comes down to the special abilities on those cards and how you work with them uh, to do what you need. I haven't had a chance to play this one yet. Um, I've heard good things about it. That is silver. Clank Acquisitions Incorporated is an expansion for Clank. This introduces player specific decks so that everyone will start with a different starting deck that is unique to them and has its own asymmetric twist. Uh, so that's really interesting. It also comes with miniatures that represent your characters. Haven't played this one yet, but very excited to add it to my copy of Clank because it's just a game that I love. You can see my review elsewhere on the channel to see why. We Need to Talk is a party game from Smirk and Laughter Games. I really like the theme of this one. You're staging an intervention. So one player is having an intervention held for them. And for example, they might have uncontrollable interpretive dancing. And the other players are trying to 
clue them in to what is going on, but without giving it away too much. So there's this interesting scoring where you are each taking it in turns to say little snippets, to give information, and you'll, you will get points potentially if the player who's guessing guesses after you give them information. So you want to inspire them to guess, but if they guess and get it right really early on, they're gonna get loads of points, and that's gonna be terrible for for the rest of you because then you're gonna to struggle to win the game. So there's this balance of trying to eke out the information. It has the kind of feel of, of like subtly, gently introducing the idea of why you're at this intervention. And of course, the idea is that nothing, there's nothing too serious. It's all very like silly things that, um, and often quite specific that the guesser is having to work out as that information comes around. I, I think there's just a fun sort of real world take on this. And there's just a little smidgen of like role playing as the players get to give away their clues. Um, so I need to play this one a bit more to, to see how I like the scoring of it. But I, I really like the theme and I think this could be a good one for potential laughter and groups that really like to get into a party game and the theme of it. That is We Need to Talk. Revolution 1828 is a game from designer Stefan Feld who tends to design games a bit heavier for me, uh, but this one is a departure for him. It's a lighter game, it's a two-player game about the election of 1828, which was the first smear campaign type of election in America's history between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. I like that it's a more simpler two-player game, but they're adding a theme to it with a bit of history behind it. And I understand it's a little bit like the tug-of-war aspect of something like Battle Line, so interested to try a simpler game from a really popular designer. Haven't played this one yet. That is Revolution of 1828. 20 Second Showdown is a party game from Big Potato where you are completing different challenges. You're playing on teams and you're just racing to do something. It's got this massive timer. It's really cool. I mean, it's not so great now because it's making a noise, but I like that it's a sand timer that's actually making a noise so you can hear when it stops. Uh, because generally that's the flaw of playing games with sand timers is that if you're not watching it then you don't know when the round has ended. Uh, so the idea is that you'll be assigned a task such as balance three things on top of each other or whistle the whole of happy birthday. Just completely random things that you're going to have to do as fast as possible and uh, try and win for your team. So uh, I think it's all going to come down to how good the challenges are and whether uh, it's the kind of party game for my group but I'm sure it, it would be kind of popular with um, kids and families. That is 20 Second Showdown. Bubble Tea is a cute game from Renegade Games which comes with a little cocktail shaker uh, that has a bunch of dice in it and you are racing to complete certain missions. You've got these cards that overlay over each other like these plastic see-through cards. You're trying to arrange them in the right shape to complete the goal for that round uh, that the dice have rolled faster than the other players. So I tend to like real-time games. This one seems like it's got a simple rule set. It's very cute. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but looking forward to Bubble Tea. Nobjects is a party game with a very silly name from Pegasus where you are drawing things, but you are not drawing with a pen and paper. You are just drawing with your finger on the table, just tracing an outline. So for example, you might have to draw a telephone and you're just moving your finger around, hoping that people can work out what you're drawing. And it's surprising how well people can get across and understand things without having pen and paper. It's obviously a very silly party game. That's all there is to it. There isn't any extra twists. And I do wonder whether it won't have the longevity of other more interesting drawing games. Uh, but I need to give this one another try. That is Nobjects. Frenemy Pastry Party is a cute card game with really adorable art. I haven't played this one yet. It's from designer Jesse Lee who designed Ponzi Scheme. This is very simple uh, card game and it's really going to come down to the gameplay. I believe you've got a hidden role where you, you there's a certain ingredient that you really want. You can also uh, borrow ingredients off other players, but I don't know much more than that. It really is going to come down to the dynamic of, uh, of how it works together. So um, it's going to come down to the play of Frenemy Pastry Party. Hex Roller is a roll and write game with a very classic style. You roll a bunch of numbered and colored dice and then you are um, picking sets of numbers to then fill in on your sheet to try and finish uh, as many hexes as possible and to get points depending on the numbers that you use. There's a number of different ways to score in this. There's definitely interesting decisions but I found that it just, it didn't grab me in the way that a lot of roll and write games do. It felt 
uh, like it wasn't really bringing that much new to the table and what it was bringing um, just couldn't really match up to simpler games like Quinto. Um, and with more complicated games, it, it didn't have any kind of the, the same level of interest or excitement. Definitely decisions to be had, definitely the kind of best player wins and, and you, you can improve at this kind of game, but there's so many roll and write games out there now that this one didn't hit the spot for me quite like others do. That is Hex Roller. Those are all the games that I played at the UK Games Expo and the ones that I brought home. I had another amazing weekend, so exhausting, uh, but I just burn the candle at both ends when I go to the UK Games Expo because it's just a day long of trying to demo as many games as possible so that I can tell you guys about all the interesting games that are out there. But then also I'm playing games into the evening, hanging out with friends. I think some of the, the best fun is just hanging out with those friends. UK Games Expo is great for those evenings because you can be in the Hilton Hotel and stay late into the evening. I do wish that they would open up more um, convention space in the Hilton with those wonderful tables because it can be a real struggle, especially on Saturday, to find a table at the prime time. Um, but aside from that, I can't really fault it as a convention. And I just had a blast going back to party games that I really love. I, it had been a while since I played the Crypto and it's just such a great game. Shifty Eyed Spies is definitely one of my favorite party games of all time where you're winking at each other. That is just a classic. And when you've had a few to drink, you're exhausted and you're you're feeling that buzz of uh, of being at a convention, which just is a feeling like no other. Um, playing a game like that is just is just the perfect end to an evening. We got to play loads and loads of games of two rooms in a boom with a huge group. Um, and, and that's great because I never get a chance to play that game. Um, so to everyone that said hi, thank you so much. It was really nice to meet some of you. And to all the people that I got to play games with and chat to, uh, I just had an absolute blast and I can't wait until next year. Hopefully see some of you at Essen. If you like this video, if you like hearing about games that you generally don't hear about on other board game YouTube channels, then please consider supporting me making videos like this at patreon.com forward slash actual I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.